So but I wanted to start um, just briefly recapping what we did last time. So the, the key equation that we got was the wave equation for gravitational waves. The box operator acting on the gravitational wave is given by the energy momentum tensor. And if we are in vacuum, so far outside the source, then this thing goes to zero, and we just have the free propagation of the gravitational wave. We also looked at uh, the gauge degrees of freedom, right? So there was Lorentz gauge, which said del mu h mu nu bar equals zero. And then it was transverse traceless gauge, which I made a little bit of a mess of. So let me uh, repeat it here again. So there was two conditions. One is that the trace is zero, and the other one is that the zero i components are zero. And then from that, you can do two things, right? One we already saw last time. Um, so using essentially Lorentz gauge, but setting nu equals i, uh, you get that d0 h0 i minus del j h j i is zero. And then you see from here that this is zero. And then you see from here that it's transverse. And then the second thing you need to do is you need to set nu to zero. Uh, and then you get the condition uh, del zero h zero zero minus del zero h zero i is zero. This thing again is zero by construction. And now here you see that the, the time component, or that the time derivative of the h zero zero uh, thing is zero, right? Which means this is just a static thing in the zero zero component, but this is nothing else than just Newton's potential. Yeah, so this is not, for all intents and purposes, this is not, you can have something here which is non-zero, but it's not part of what we call the gravitational wave. It would just be part of the background metric. Yeah, so for all intents and purposes of the gravitational wave, we can actually set h zero zero to zero. Yeah, that's the thing we were missing in the lecture yesterday. And then in summary, uh, you have the conditions that h0 mu is 0 for all mu, hii is 0, and it's transverse, so del j h i j is 0. So these are the properties of the transverse traceless gauge. Any more? Questions about this, or about what we did last time? Any thoughts overnight or in the bar? OK, so today, so that was all about pre-propagation of gravitational waves. Now we need to talk about where the gravitational waves actually come from. Right? So how we can actually emit gravitational waves. What type of sources can emit gravitational waves? So imagine you have some object. Uh, and you have some observer. The observer has uh, built a gravitational wave detector. And then you have this distance here, which we call x, and this distance here, which we call y. Yeah, and we're now interested, this is r. Uh, y is much smaller than x, and we're interested in what does the observer see uh, from the source in terms of gravitational waves. So we just use uh, this equation here. Uh, and now, exactly in the same way as you know it from electrodynamics, uh, can invert this equation, meaning that the observer at the position x at the distance r, which is the absolute value of this guy, sees the gravitational waves emitted from all the points y in the source at a time when they were emitted, right? So this is observed at time t, it was emitted at time t minus r over c at some position y. So that's the object we have to evaluate. 
Um, so we're going to be working in transfer stress gauge here outside the source. Um, so we'll be mainly interested in the spatial components of this object. And for the spatial components of this object, I'm going to claim that the following relation holds. I will prove it in a minute. So the claim is that I can express the spatial components in this integral uh, by multiplying with these distance vectors uh, the zero, zero component. That's not obvious. Um, but let me show you why this is true nevertheless. So we're going to use uh, energy momentum conservation. Which just explicitly writing out the sum means this, T, uh, del i t zero i is zero. Um, now we're going to take this equation here. We're going to uh, differentiate on both sides with del zero. It's very simple math. So t zero squared t zero zero is um, minus del k del 0 del 0 k. Uh, we use again this trick, right, that we can, with a minus sign, we can switch the zeros here with i's. So this is the same as del k, uh, use l dl dl k. Um, And now we just multiply the entire equation by uh, this object here, y i y j. So you're seeing this is starting to look like, yeah, well, starting to look like a bit, little bit like the right hand side here. So y i y j del zero squared t zero zero on the right hand side here, so we have y i y j del k del l t l k. And now the thing we want to show, this thing, uh, lives inside the integral. Yeah, so we can in particular use partial integration, um, which means we can move these derivatives, which are now acting on t, we can move them over here acting on y. Uh, but then of course these derivatives are very trivial, right, because they're just spatial derivatives acting on vectors in space. So you get uh, factor two for the two possible permanent perm mutations, um, and then simply tij, okay, because these just contract to delta functions. Uh, but this is exactly uh, what we wanted to show, okay, because this is just exactly, if you plug it in here, this is exactly the relation we wanted to show. Should, the derivative should be inside of the integral, shouldn't it? Because otherwise you like integrate out the variables. Well, but this is an this is an integral over time, and this is a uh, an, an integral over space. So the derivative over time, this is over space. So you can it doesn't matter. Sorry, we're doing no integration by parts. I mean, you only integrate about uh, the source, right? Or yes. Just about infinity. So what about the total derivative? Do we assume that the energy moment tends to just vanish? Uh, yeah. Right, right, right. So the, the, the assumption is that out here you're in the vacuum, right? And here there's no energy momentum tensor, and the energy momentum tensor is only localized okay. uh, to the object. It just have a, it's, you know, it doesn't have to be sharp, I guess. It just has to be <coughs> Yeah. Here, right, right. I'm throwing away the, the boundary terms here. True. OK, and now we combine. Yes? Yesterday you were talking about a back reaction. Yes, in 10 minutes. It's not zero then, right? In 10 minutes. Yeah, it'll be exactly the next thing that we're, that we're talking about. Yeah, and then you can, and then you can see if, if that then answers your question or if it doesn't answer your question. 
OK, so just inserting this relation inside here and focusing, we're only going to look at uh, the spatial components because at the end of the day, we're going to work in transverse traceless gauge. Um, this object, gravitational wave, at point T and X, a uh, bunch of prefactors. So note also this one over R dependence, right? This is exactly the same as an electromagnetism. It's just like uh, as you go further away, you know, the volume, or the, the volume of the sphere becomes bigger, and so it becomes the amplitude becomes smaller. Um, and then just this object here. So what this tells you is that the gravitational wave at some point out here uh, is given by this object here, the integral over the zero, zero component of the energy momentum tensor multiplied with y i y j. Uh, but that is nothing else than the tensor moment of the source. Okay, so this object here, usually denoted with capital I i j, that is a tensor moment associated with this source. Yeah, so if you know the properties of your source, you compute this thing, and then you will know what is the gravitational wave signal from the source at any point uh, in space. Can I erase this? And we're going to introduce now, just for notation, an object I slash, which is the traceless version of this object here. Um, And this is exactly, so this slashed object is exactly the quadrupole moment. And so it's a, this is the same quadrupole, quadrupole moment you know from the regular mechanics. Uh, this is exactly the thing. So once you go to transverse traceless gauge, the full glory of this equation, um, H in transverse traceless gauge, So these are just the time derivatives from over there. Uh, and here, we're going to introduce what is called a projector. So this projector, what it does is because we've gone to transfer spatial gate over here, um, what this projector does, it takes this object, and in case it is not yet transfer traceless, uh, it makes it transfer traceless. Okay. So because we're using the slashed object, it's going to be traceless anyway. Um, that's, that's how it was constructed. But in case this object is, is, this does not have the desired properties, this projector just picks out that part of, the, um, that part of, this, ob th of this object that has its properties. So, I mean, you can construct these things in a formal way, but essentially what it means um, is you, you pick a direction, right? Because you have to be you have to be transverse to something, so you pick the direction of your gravitational wave. That would be the uh, the r vector over there, and let's pick the r vector in the z direction. And then what this object would do is you act with this uh, object here, lambda i j k l, on any uh, matrix, which is a Let's take a symmetric tree by tree matrix, uh, which is what we'll be, be caring about in the end. Um, and then what this guy does is make sure that here you have 
a11 minus a22 minus a11 minus a22 a12 a12 and everything else is zero three more zeros here okay so this is simply a geometric object uh, which takes whatever you give it here and makes it so such that it is transverse traceless Uh, we should give this equation a name. So this equation is important. I mean, and this is what I mean. So, what, what this equation is telling you is that the gravitational waves are sourced at, at leading order. The gravitational waves are sourced by the quadrupole moment of the source. Yeah, this is different than electromagnetism. In electromagnetism, it's the dipole moment uh, that would source anything, right? But here, here the leading order uh, is really the, the quadrupole term. Which is, by the way, the reason why, for example, anything, um, anything spherical, so for example, the Earth just sitting there does not emit gravitational waves. You have a, a supernova collapse, which is uh, spherical, can be a huge blast, no gravitational waves. Yeah, so the, the gravitational wave signals are only proportional to the, to the quadrupole moment. So you can have things which like, look like they will like, massively be doing something to gravity. If there's no quadrupole moment, there's no gravitational waves. Which is why we need two black holes, uh, black hole, black hole merger, in order to see something in LIGO. A single black hole flying to space, nothing. OK, and so now we come to the thing I was already bringing up a little bit yesterday, the energy momentum tensor of gravitational waves. OK, so what is the problem? The problem is so far, so far we have taken a flat background metric, Minkowski, yeah, and we've looked at a s small perturbation of this metric, uh, and then we've uh, computed what the equation looks like, what its properties are, uh, how we can see it at some distance. But this gravitational wave, uh, it will carry some energy. Uh, and if it carries some energy, we most likely have some sort of energy momentum tensor. But it, if it has an energy momentum tensor, and you plug that into Einstein's equations, it will tell you that your metric is no longer flat. Right? So there's a question on if what we have been doing is really consistent. Uh, and but the, so okay, so then you say, okay, well that's not so bad. Then maybe I just don't insist on a flat metric. I should just take some general background metric, right? And that what we will do, we'll take some general uh, g mu nu with with index b, which will be the background metric. And then you can look about small perturbations around this background metric, and then self-consistently try and find out in the end what w is the actual background metric. But there's a problem with that. And the problem with that is that we define the gravitational wave, we define the, the flat metric to be independent of space and time, and the gravitational wave uh, to be the component which is dependent on space and time. Yeah, that was a clear separation. We knew what we were doing. If you now say the background metric maybe also depends on space and time, well then how do you know what you call the gravitational wave and how do you, what do you call the background metric? Uh, and in general, you can't. Yeah? So in general, for an arbitrary difficult problem, you can't. Yeah? Because it's, if, if your background metric is very <coughs> time dependent and you have gravitational waves on top of that, you just, it's very difficult to find a consistent description. Yeah? But of course, in many, many practical cases it is. Yeah? And this is, if you want, this is like similar to what happens, for example, uh, in the ocean. Yeah, you can have currents and waves, and you want to associate a current field to the currents, and then the waves are little ripples on top of that. 
And in most cases, that works very well, right? In a wave, is a very good description, even if it's not a fundamental description of what's going on. Um, but of course, there can be situations where it doesn't work, right? I mean, if you come to some strange patch in the oceans where the waves are very weird and the, the currents are very weird, maybe you don't really know what is what. So what this all is, is nothing else than uh, effective field theories. Um, so we can do something sensible if we have a separation of scales. Yeah, so imagine we have some background, uh, which is varying on some, some length scale, and we have some gravitational wave, which is varying on a much shorter length scale. Yeah, and then it's clear what we do, right? Then we define that there's some length scale associated with this, which is uh, the, the length of the background. There's a length scale associated with this, which is the wavelength of the gravitational wave. And then we can define some intermediate scale, yeah, suitable to the problem, say d, and if we, if we average over d, we will essentially not change what, the, what this background thing looks like, but we will have gotten rid of the gravitational wave. Right? So we can, we can average over this, this problem with d, and then we can compare the average and the non-average description, uh, and then that will allow us to see what is the gravitational wave and what is the background. So the condition that we need essentially for this to work is that the lambda of the gravitational wave has to be much smaller than this distance d, which we can choose as a suitable, which has to be much smaller than the length scale of the, at which the background changes. Or alternatively, uh, you can also do this in time. Yeah, because uh, actually, if you think about, um, if you think about LIGO, uh, this would actually not work, right? Because uh, the, the wavelengths we're trying to detect uh, are roughly of, of roughly of similar size as the detector. The detector is for kilometers. The, the gravitational field of the, of the Earth is not at all constant on the length scale of four kilometers, right? So for LIGO, we cannot do a separation of scales like this. But what we can do is a separation of frequencies, yeah? Because it also works in the exact same way if you imagine this picture not in space but in time. So if the frequency of the gravitational wave is much bigger than the frequency of the background, then we can play the same trick just by averaging in time. And that's what happens with LIGO because the field is not very constant spatially, but it is very, the background field is very constant in time. Uh, at least, uh, and that essentially limits also the frequencies that we can actually measure uh, on Earth with a detector. We can only measure frequencies uh, which are higher than whatever is going on in the background. Okay, so let's do this. Um, so then that's, that's the idea, and that's probably an idea I mean, which, you've, which you've encountered many times. Right? This is effective field theories. Um, it's kind of the difference between a microscopic and a macroscopic description. Uh, but what we want to do now is really very explicitly turn this idea uh, into equations. So we're going to um, go back to Einstein equations. So we start all over again with indices. I thought I was done with indices. Um, so let me write it one more time. I get the name. Okay, and now we're going to expand the left hand side in orders of our gravitational wave. <coughs> okay, so we're going to have a we're going to have a G mu nu background, which we don't yet specify what it is, uh, plus some h mu nu. I'm going to expand an h mu nu. So simply formally, we can write a g mu nu, some g mu nu background, plus g mu nu first order, plus g mu nu second order. That's all we need. Where this is, OK, this is order h to 0 by definition order h to the 1, order h to the 2. And now we're going to ask, if we do this averaging procedure here, are these objects going to be high frequency or low frequency objects? Yeah, Short wavelength or long wavelength things. 
So this thing is just a background. Okay, so by, by definition, this is going to be a low momentum. So along, like either, yeah. Then let's do it, and in, in it, it works exactly the same way for time and space. Let's think in space, yeah. So this is some uh, long wavelength oscillation. Uh, this is going to be some short wavelength oscillation, yeah, because just given by the, the small lambda GW, so this is a high K object. But this object, so this, okay, it, it comes with two powers of H. Yeah, so for sure we'll have some contributions which are high momentum. But you could imagine that like your first H, so your first H is a function of K1, your second H is a function of K2. And now if you have K1 roughly minus K2, uh, then the length scale which is contained in this in the end will actually be very low K. Yeah, so the second order object uh, will contain both high K and low K things, right? So if we do this averaging procedure, um, we will get kind of from, for the long wavelength things, we get contributions from here and from here, and from for the high wavelength things, uh, the short wavelength things, we'll get contributions from here and from here. Yeah, and that's the way the tricky thing arises. We need to disentangle uh, what's going on at second order in H in order to write down something sensible. Yeah, it's the, the low K contribution at second order in H which goes back and contributes to our background. And that's the only time ever you have to go to second order in a gravitational wave perturbation. Okay, so let's look at the low K contribution because that's the one that modifies the background. That's what we're going to be interested in. So G mu nu background is G mu nu, the full G mu nu. Um, well, actually, you let me use for this the energy. For this, I will use Einstein equation. So it's this thing here, 8 pi g c to the 4 t mu nu low k. And then there's also this contribution, OK? So it's g mu nu second low k contribution. OK, but we know how to get low k. So it just means we need to average over our intermediate distance d. So this is nothing else than g mu nu second averaged over distance d plus this object here also averaged over d. And now we're just going to define this object here, because we see, OK, it, it appears in Einstein's equation in the exact same way as T mu nu does. So we're just going to define an object, small T mu nu. Then we can take it outside like this. Which is given by the second order, con the the average second order contribution uh, with the same prefactor that we obtain here. Okay? So because this is this term here, you can see from the equation, is precisely how the gravitational wave in second order acts in the Einstein equation. Yeah, so this is nothing else, and we can yeah, names don't mean much, but this is nothing else than the way an energy momentum tensor would act. Okay, so we're essentially going to define this thing. Because it, it acts in Einstein's equation as an energy momentum tensor. So for all intents and purposes, it is an energy momentum tensor. OK, well, so we're going to define this object here uh, as the energy momentum tensor of the gravitational wave, which modifies the background. At the moment, we, we haven't computed it yet, right? We've only identified it. Now we need to go uh, and compute this object. And for example, um, using, using Bianchi's identity, I mean, you know that uh, covariant derivative of the left-hand side of Einstein's equation is zero. 
And then you immediately see from the way this thing is constructed um, that that also means that the sum of these two guys uh, has to be zero. Yeah, so the, the, the usual energy momentum tensor, uh, energy momentum conservation still holds. So yeah, this is energy momentum tensor. Yeah, it's one of these arguments which are nearly circular, but not quite circular. OK, so here we looked at the low k contribution. And that's all we, we're going to do uh, for now. You could also look at the high k uh, contribution of, of essentially this equation, yeah, just by taking the opposite terms. Uh, and that will tell you, so this equation tells you how the gravitational wave back react on the background. The other equation will tell you how the gravitational waves uh, actually travel in the perturbed background. Yeah, but we're going to focus on, on only this equation for now. Um, so then what we need to do is we need to compute t mu nu, which means we need to compute t mu nu to second order in H. So it's not as bad as one would think it is. So we want what we need is g mu nu second. Uh, in order to get that, we need r mu nu second. No way. Okay. So let me just say it's not. I, I write down the first two terms just to s show you what the idea is. Um, I, I don't think yeah, we we really gain much by me writing it down with wrong indices in full glory. Um, but it's not so bad. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's only thirteen terms. Um, and all the thirteen terms are essentially of a similar type. So you always have, I mean, you have, right? this is the second order thing. So you always need two powers of the gravitational waves. And everything else can only be uh, deltas or contractions. And then it goes on, OK? So another 11 terms. It's, it's in Majora's textbook in full glory. Um, but I mean, you know, you know how to do it, right? I mean, you, you do the expansion in the Christopher symbols, and then from the Christopher symbols, you go to Riemann tensor. From the Riemann tensor, you contract, and you go to here. Now, once we go, uh, we go so there's now there's two interesting parts. One is that we are computing this object uh, within these expectation value brackets, which is a spatial average over some distance d. Yeah, which means there is an integral here, right? So this is something like 1 over volume d3x over something. Yeah, which means, again, we can use uh, integration by parts. And also, we're going to impose tt gauge. So transverse tracers gauge. I mean, and in particular, Lorentz gauge, right? You can already see, I mean, we, OK, now these are, of course, bad examples. but. Within all these terms, there are, of course, many terms where the derivative is acting on H in a way that once you impose the Lorentz condition, that it's zero. So in the end, um, you get that R mu nu second average over D is minus 1 over 4 del nu h alpha beta del nu h alpha beta. And also this is, of course, average over d. OK, so in the end, uh, in the end, you get a very simple expression. 
So that was R mu nu. Now if we want to compute G mu nu, we also need uh, to compute the, the second term on that left blackboard. But that's also very simple because he here, now you can explicitly check that the Ricci scalar to second order is zero uh, and also the Ricci scalar to first order is zero. And so that means that this thing is already nothing else but G mu nu. Yeah, so it's one of these computations which get ridiculously messy on the way, but the result is, uh, is very nice. And this is because of the averaging that it cancels out, or just even without, or well that it's zero? Um, I think you need both, because you need, okay, because you, you need to contract um, the Ricci scalar you get from contracting this object, right? So, I mean, you only get to this simple formula uh, after using both transverse traceless gauge and partial integration. So you've already used it to get to here. So then putting everything together, this was our definition of T mu nu. So this is the expression for the energy momentum tensor uh, of the gravitational waves. And I should mention that there's another completely independent but also nice derivation in so Majora book one and then it's section 2.1.2 uh, where he does it completely in the field theory language. Okay, because uh, an energy momentum tensor and you just you can also get by just look t starting with the action, then doing variations with the action, imposing no percurrence, um, and at the end of the day you arrive at at, at obviously at the same expression. Um, I find it in the field theory uh, duration I find it a bit harder to see uh, to explain where these expectation value brackets come in, right? So the computations are easier, but it's a bit harder to see why you have to do the averaging, but. Yeah, they're just two, two completely independent ways of, in the end, arriving at the same result. Any questions on that? Yeah. Uh, sorry, what again was the exact definition of this averaging position? Uh, here, that we, here. Uh, we essentially, we, we look at our problem. Yeah, we identify a typical scale of the gravitational wave and a typical scale of the, of the background. And if the scale of the gravitational wave is much, much smaller than the scale of the background, we define some arbitrary scale somewhere in between so that this condition is met. And then we just average off on that scale. And if you don't have this condition, then you obviously you can't do it, right? Then, then you have to do full numerical GR or something like that. There was another question? Yeah. Uh, when you, you yeah, right. It will still happen. It will still happen, but you have a suppression with H, right? Because I mean, it, it is a good expansion parameter because H, H is tiny, right? I mean, for the event that we measured, H was 10 to minus 21, right? So it was, in principle, it was a good idea to what we did last time, which was just to stop after first order. Right, but when you start after first order, you realize that you miss, uh, you completely qualitatively miss an effect, right? I mean, you can't, you can't say, I'm measuring the energy in gravitational waves, while at the same time saying, oh, but they can't carry energy, right? So there we were just doing something inconsistent. Now, um, do we have gone now we have this effect, right? Then now, oh, there will be, of course, corrections to this effect. Yeah, but the corrections, they will now really be suppressed by, by a tiny number. But one does actually have to be careful because also it's a bit subtle here going, doing an expansion in certain orders of H because G mu nu is defined in this way, right? So it's not completely obvious that if you expand this to some object order and 
distant some order that you consistently get. I mean, you need to very be, be careful like which order you go to where in order to get something which is, has a well-defined order here. Yeah, but in the end, and in the end, even if you do something slightly inconsistently, it doesn't really matter because in the end, so in the full theory, if you go to all orders, you will get the same result either way you do it, right? And any mistakes that you do are suppressed by, by this tiny value of h. Any other questions? I mean, the reason this is important is because in the end, this is, of course, the type of thing that we, do, that we can actually measure, right? I mean, so we can measure two things. We can measure the gravitational wave directly, uh, so really the amplitude itself, by the way it acts on test masses, the way we discussed last time. But we can also measure the energy which is emitted in gravitational waves. Okay, so this is now about essentially applying the, the two results that we had at this lecture. So we had one lecture that one, one key equation was that the amplitude of the gravitational waves depended on the quadruple moment. And the second equation is that the energy density depends on the derivatives of the amplitudes. So now we're going to put them both, both these results together and that will lead us to um, what is called Einstein's quadruple formula. Okay, so imagine you have some gravitational waves uh, in some volume. And the energy of these gravitational waves yeah, is now just given by an integral, volume integral g3x over the t00 component. So the energy emission, which is uh, energy divided by T, and we also put a C here, um, that is just, okay, so it's obviously it's a time derivative of that, and now we use the usual trick, right, energy conservation, that we can write time derivatives uh, as spatial derivatives, d3x del i t0 i, Okay, this is the same as d0 t0 0. zero. Um, and now we're going to look at, this is a volume integral, yeah? and now we're going to define some unit vector n and a surface s, and now we can rewrite this volume integral uh, as a surface integral over the surface s, and then here we have just a unit vector times T0i. Yeah, this is n. <coughs> okay, and now imagine you have some, some spherical sphere, yeah, very far, like you have a source in the middle which is emitting gravitational waves or something, and then you have a, a sphere very far on the outside. Uh, so then we want to uh, here use the only the radial direction. So We can write the surface integral just as the distance, the, the radius, so this is now the radius, r, over the, the omega, so just the angular component. Uh, this just becomes t0 r, we only pick the radial direction. And now we're going to exploit that, so t, t was, is a function of the gravitational waves, right? And the gravitational waves um, are some function, so that they had some 1 over r dependence, and then they were just some function of t minus r over c. 
And that was the structure of H. And so that means we can uh, rewrite. Right, so we can, and, and the other thing that I need is that T0R, what does that mean? Uh, it meant that we take the dr derivative. So, ah, I'm running out of space here. Let me do it on the next board. Okay, so what is T0R, right, is nothing but essentially D0H, DRH, yeah? And now H, we know, is 1 over R and some function of uh, T minus R over C. Yeah, so that means you can rewrite this derivative by just flipping the integration variable. Uh, because you can just use that, um, yeah, the 0h uh, is essentially the same as minus drh, okay, just due to this relation here. So that means we, you can, instead of writing t0r here, which is a, like a slightly unusual object, you can express this with t00. So what you get in the end is r squared the omega t zero zero. Can I get rid of this? Okay, so now we can compute the power in gravitational waves. So, energy over time. Now we use the equation star, which is still there. Some prefactors. Okay, so we, you, you, we've used that equation, um, but we've inserted uh, this relation here. And now we use the, the other equation that we had, uh, which we had right in the beginning, which told you how the gravitational wave depends on the quadrupole moment. Now we can just insert it here. Um, so again, a prefactor. Keep the angle integral. There was a projection operator. And then these guys depended on the second time derivative of the quadruple moment. Yeah, so now there's another time derivative here. So we have the third derivative of the quadruple moment. Okay, and this thing, this thing is actually independent uh, of this angular integral. Yeah, so the angular integral is really just the angular integral over the projection operator. And that is, okay, then that's just like, uh, yeah, doing the, the geometric projection. You get a bunch of um, combinations of delta with some coefficients. Delta i, k, delta j, l, minus 4, delta i, j, delta k, l, plus delta i, l, delta j, k. So this you get from the, the explicit form of the projection operator. Um, and then 
altogether, the power going into gravitational waves is just, so this, all what this does, it modifies this prefactor, right? Ah, given by the third derivative of the quadrupole moment. And this is uh, this is Einstein's uh, quadruple formula. Um, and this is, for example, so actually the, the first so the first detection of gravitational waves was an indirect detection. Uh, that's much much longer ago. And what people observed is that um, you had a, a system of, of of pulsars which was which was rotating. Um, and what what people co would observe is that. The, like you would expect just from Newton mechanics, you would ob expect if you had two point-like particles circling each other, they would just circle each other forever. And it's just that there's a stable orbit. And what people observed is that you actually they started moving towards each other. They started in spiraling. Yeah, and that's only possible if you lose energy. And the only way to lose energy would be gravitational waves. Yeah, so essentially, this formula correctly predicted the rate of energy loss uh, that was observed in the system. And that was kind of the first indirect evidence of gravitational waves. That was before LIGO. Yes? So this is not really relevant, but I'm a bit confused about the factors of C because... Oh, because normally, okay, normally C is always one in all of my computations, yeah. right? Um, This? Okay, so I'm confident about this last formula. Okay. Um, yeah, now we'd have to check this, the powers of C here. You mean? Yeah. Uh, it could be, w w what are any powers of C in the in that first equation? Yeah, there was a one over C to the four in that equation, right? In the in this equation. Yeah. Right. There's, there's a, so there's a one over c to the eight coming in here. Ah oh, no, but then it's fine. No, we start at three and we subtract eight. We land at five downstairs. Yeah, but uh, I'm more confused about that thing as a c to the fourth. And you have to multiply it again by c from that thing there. Ah, but here I don't have to see anymore. Yeah, so then it goes to the other side, right? Yeah. Okay, so I... Because it doesn't really matter. Yeah, it's one anyway, right? Um, well, so we, we, okay, so the, the best thing to do is to check the units, right? Because that's, that's the way to read re properly. Mm -hmm. So the, okay, so the power, the power of G is, is, is correct, right? Because it's the leading, leading order in Newton's constant. So we need whatever powers of C we need to, to get, the, get the dimensions right. Yeah, like for example, when I switched R, ah, here's, so here's one thing. So I erased it now, right? But when I switched from uh, T0, 0 to T0 R, or vice versa, right? I said the derivative with respect to time is the same as the derivative with respect to space, just with a minus sign. There's a C, of course, also in, in that yeah. equation. Yeah, okay. So the key formulas are correct because Majora also has the C. Um, but all the intermediate steps, um, yeah, could be me dropping the C. Any more? Yes? So this uh, power only accounts for the low frequency gravitational wave because we're averaging over this D? Uh, high frequency. High frequency. Well, no, okay, so this, this, this. No, so this is, a, okay, so this is, you have. Okay, so if you, high frequency in the sense is okay, you, you have you have some background metric, and you have some gravitational waves, right? And you can only apply this formalism if either the length scale of the gravitational wave is much shorter than the length scale of the background, or if the frequency of the gravitational wave is much faster than the frequency of the background. And this thing uh, accounts for the thing you call a gravitational wave. Yeah, so it's either the the, the short wavelength thing or the high frequency thing 
depending on if you're averaging in space or in time. Any more questions? Ah, no, we, we, loosed, we used, good question. So we used the low k part of the equation, right? So we essentially, we had Einstein equation, um, and we can separate this into two equations. Yeah, one which we get by looking only at the low k modes, and the other one which we get by looking only at the high k modes. Yeah, but both are valid equations, and they say whatever they say. Yeah, and it turns out that the low k mode, that told us how the high frequency gravitational waves affect the background metric. Yeah, because the T mu nu came from the second order, like two, from two high fre frequency gravitational waves combined to form one low frequency object, and that is what modified the background metric. But you see everything is all the, 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 the T mu nu here, um, there, there's, no, there's no background length scale or background metric in here, right? I mean, it's, all, it's, all, it's completely sourced by the thing we call a gravitational wave. Okay, so just um, two remarks. So we saw that the uh, leading order term always comes from the quadruple moment, right? So you should wonder like what happened to the dipole moment. Why, why does electromagnetism, what's the difference between ele electromagnetism and gravity? Why does electromagnetism have a dipole source and gravity does not? Yeah, and there's a, there's a somewhat heuristic argument to see what happens. So the dipole, the electric dipole and electromagnetism would be given by something like this. So you have a charge um, and, a, and a displacement. So let's try and very naively transform this to gravity. So the, the charges and gravity uh, are just masses and the displacement stays at the displacement. Uh, but what is this? I mean, this is the, the derivative of this uh, is nothing else. So if we take uh, the derivative of this object, that's momentum, okay? But momentum is conserved. And because momentum is conserved, this thing cannot source uh, the gravitational wave. It cannot emit energy. And the same is true for the magnetic dipole. Yeah? So for the, the magnetic dipole and electromagnet, magnet, or yeah, for the electric, bah, for the magnetic uh, dipole, you would write something like uh, displacement x, uh, x cross, fantastic. Um, let's call this r. So r cross m e v i. Yeah, you do the same trick, and this is angular momentum. Okay, so it's because these are conserved quantities. Uh, there is no, they are not related to a to a source of gravitational waves. Yeah, and the corresponding quantities are not conserved uh, in, in electromagnetism. So it's a, it's a fairly heuristic argument, right? But it gives like some intuition of what's going on. Um, and the second comment is that we have, so we've assumed um, essentially that, yeah, how to put this? Um, okay, let me just put it. So we have assumed implicitly uh, all the time here that V over C is much smaller than one. Yeah, because we've always been working in with, with non-relativistic sources, or alternatively, uh, we have been working with, if you want, with uh, objects where the size of the source, this is the size of the source, over the wavelength of the gravitational wave, uh, no, let me, um, yeah. let's just leave it at that. So we have implicitly assumed that we're working in a non-relativistic non limit. Um, and that, that is fine most of the time, right? I mean, for sure, if we want to measure gravitational waves with, with, with LIGO, um, the mirrors are moving non-relativistically. Most sources are non-relativistic. Uh, but if you look at a black hole-black hole merger, 
like just before, because they speed up as they in spiral, so just before they crash, uh, V over C is not so small. Yeah, it's about 0.5 or something. Yeah, so then, then this description uh, breaks down. So it's just good to be aware that we made that assumption. So how the, the velocity doesn't, doesn't uh, come around in your calculation, does it? Yeah, so let me... Um, so what we... Let me see. Okay, so the... Okay, so lambda is the... Lambda is the wavelength of the gravitational wave. Um, that is just given by 1 over omega, which is the frequency of the gravitational wave. And now for a typical source, um, so let's, let's imagine two black holes which are spiraling. Yeah? Uh, this frequency is essentially given by the, the size of the source, the distance, um, divided by the velocity at which they travel. Yeah? So here, velocity. And then we still have the C. So what we implicitly assumed um, is that d, so d over lambda, yeah, according to this, is c over v, and we Im assumed implicitly. Uh, wait, c over v. D over lambda is v over c, right? Uh, what we implicitly assumed is that this is much smaller than one. So we actually made the assumption on the left-hand side. Um, so we, we assumed that the yeah we, we implicitly assumed that the size of the source was small compared to the uh, emitted wavelength, and then that transl translates to bound on V over C. Gravity not? Is it also related to the fact that gravity only has positive mass and electromagnetism, of course, has both plus or minus charges, or not really? I mean, that would more be like a monopole thing, right? Um, maybe. <laughs> um, I, I don't see any obvious way right now. I mean, that, that's obviously a very fundamental difference between gravity and a very important difference between gravity and elect electromagnetism. I don't see any immediate way to, to relate the two, but... Sorry, why was the question? Uh, if, if the fact that, uh, that gravity doesn't have a dipole source, if that's related to the fact that there's no positive and negative charges in gravity, whereas there is an electromagnetism. Homework. I was supposed to give homework. <laughs> homework. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Right, that would be an interesting homework question. I, I would be curious to know the answer. Well, but you don't source. Yes, you can write down a dipole, but it doesn't source gravitational waves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I would say that I would call this a, I would call this a dipole in, in, in gravity. So yeah, I think you would have to ask if the, if the fact that there's no negative masses of that somehow related to uh, momentum conservation. Yeah. Mm. Well, because you have to, in order to you, because you you need right, you need to emit you need to emit if you emit gravitational wave right, it means that your source is to lose energy, right? Otherwise, something is wrong with energy momentum conservation. So if if the if the object itself is always conserved, <laughs> then 
you, you cannot be sourcing something which carries energy itself. Unless, unless that energy, that, that energy would have to carry momentum, right? It would have to carry angular momentum, for example. If it doesn't, otherwise you just can't, you can't have a, th this thing conserved and at the same time have energy momentum conservation. Yeah, yeah, energy, you, you just you need the covariant derivative, right? So you, you would have, uh, so in flat space you write t mu, a del mu t mu nu is zero, right? And in curved space you use the, the covariant derivative. And, and you get this essentially, you get this because it's Einstein's equation, yeah? So you have this, and on the other side you have the, the Riemann, uh, the, the, the Ricci tensor, um, or the g mu nu object to be precise. And you can check, and this object acting on and the G mu nu is the Bianchi identity. So that is zero. So then you know this has to be zero too. So that imposes energy momentum conservation. To define momentum? What did energy conservation for momentum? You But you say you're saying this does not imply, this does not imply energy momentum conservation. Or you're saying the Bianchi identity <coughs> doesn't always hold. No, no, this, this is not <laughs> Yeah. But I think this is related with Kinnibatto. I don't see. Yeah. It, then it must be it must come through the Bianchi identity because I mean the, the, if you have, you have Einstein's equation right, and. The left hand side, d mu, d mu on the left hand side is, is just, yeah, bank identity. So. Okay, so now we do something easy. We talk about, well, um, better not say that. Talk about experiments, um, very briefly. So very briefly, just from the, from the theory's point, theorist's point of view, somebody, because I've been mentioning LIGO, um, you've probably all heard about it in some way, uh, even in the news. Um, but I want to at least, you know, brief mention the three different types of gravitational wave detectors uh, that we have or we will have. So um, the first one is, um, so experiments. So the first set are the ground-based experiments, right? So this is uh, LIGO. There's also Virgo in Italy. There's GEO in Germany, but it's a bit small. Uh, and there's Kagra, which is being built in Japan. And they all basically work the same way, well, from my point of view. So you have a laser. You have a beam splitter, and then you just build a Michelson interferometer, right? So you shoot, light goes here, there's a mirror, and back, and here, and mirror, and back, and then it comes out here. Uh, and here you essentially have, a, uh, you have your detector, which just measures photons, right? And so what you want to do is you want to tune this so that you're here, you're essentially on the dark fringe, so you essentially, s you have a, a destructive interference, and then, <coughs> In the proper detector frame, the picture is that this, if, you, if a gravitational wave passes, this distance would shift relative to this distance, um, and then of course your interference patterns change and you would suddenly see light. So the, the strain sensitivity of LIGO, so if, if the gravitational wave passes, say this mirror moves by a distance delta L, uh, where the entire arm length here is L. So the sensitivity of LIGO is delta L over L uh, is 10 to the minus 21. Now the arm length of LIGO is four kilometers, right? So if you put something of kilometer size in there, this tells you that delta L that they can measure is 10 to the minus 18 meters. That's really small. The radius of a proton Right, well, a proton, not 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 an atom. A proton is ten to the minus fifteen. 
meters. Yeah, so this, the displacement that they're measuring is three orders of magnitude uh, below the size of an individual proton. Um, or what you, of course, you're actually measuring is you need to compare it. Uh, you have some light here, right? Some lambda, not the gravitational wave, but the light, the laser light. And of course, what you what you're actually measuring because it's an interferometer is you're measuring it in units uh, of this little lambda, right? So you need to uh, compare it with that. So they have about a, a micrometer uh, light source. So that means the delta phi, so the the phase shift that they get, which corresponds to this displacement, is uh, five times ten to the minus eleven radians. Yeah. So. I don't know. I, I always thought that you can, with an in interferometer, that you could measure things which are, you know, roughly of the wavelength of the light. Um, this is like way, way, way smaller than the wavelength of the light. Way smaller. Okay, so you, okay, so you start wondering how they do it. Um, the arm length is chosen. Okay, so if you see this this relation, um, and, okay, and this is essentially, I mean, this this is then proportional to the the amplitude of the gravitational wave, right? So, what you, in principle, what you want to do, so say you can measure an absolute displacement with some accuracy, right? Which essentially means you can measure it to, to some fraction of a wavelength. So now, in order to have the best sensitivity, what you want to do is you want to make your detector maximally big, right? But if you make your detector maximally big, you run into very practical problems, yeah? So there's money, but there's also the curvature of the Earth. So it, it becomes not so trivial to build very big detectors. Okay, so four kilometers is essentially a compromise um, between you want to be as big as possible, but at the same time, yeah, there's reality, um, and also you want to target a particular frequency. Okay, because essentially your, your your peak your peak sensitivity will be related, like you you be particularly sensitive to gravitational waves whose Frequency is not too different from this arm length here. So we can, of course, easily compute the, the relationship between the frequency and, and the wavelength, right? Because gravitational wave just travel at the speed of light. So um, if you want to require the lambda of the gravitational wave to be roughly of order of the distance here, then that tells you that the length in so LIGO's frequency is roughly 100 hertz peak frequency. And here you find 750 kilometers. Now, so ideally you would want to build LIGO with 750 kilometers. Um, LIGO is not 750 kilometers big, it's four kilometers big, okay? So what happened, yeah? So what happened is that they, they use a clever trick and it actually doesn't look like this, but it has another set of mirrors uh, here and here. Uh, and it, what this is now called a, a Fabry Perot Fabry Perot interferometer, because what happens is the light, when it comes back here, it bounces off the second mirror, and it bounces and bounces and bounces, and the same here, you get like this, many 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 times, uh, like a couple of hundred, a couple of thousand times. So you effectively you can imagine it, and like and only essentially if these mirrors have a very very particular distance. Uh, all these light sources, because they also then all, with some, so they get reflected and transmitted with some probability, so they also all come back out here. Um, so you, could, you only have constructed interference uh, if this is a multiple of your wavelength. Yeah, so what you're effectively doing is you are taking a 750 kilometer arm and you are folding it up uh, 100 times. And that, that's how the instrument actually works. Yeah, so you get uh, constructive resonance here for, yeah, two. This is the gravitational wave momentum if this is a, a multiple of 2 pi. Um, you would still be very screwed with only one detector, yeah, because what, what does the gravitational wave do? Well, it wobbles one of the mirrors. Or what does everything else do? It wobbles the mirrors, right? So there's. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's cars passing by, there's uh, the movement of the Earth, there's like seismic sources, there's people passing by. I mean, this is, this is really, really a crazy sensitivity. 
So for example, um, there's, um, they were always talking about seismic noise. And I thought seismic noise meant, OK, well, there's an earthquake somewhere, and the mirror wobbles, right? So what they do is they, the mirror is not like this, right? The mirror is like, uh, so there's a mirror. It's round, and it's ha hanging from, from like very complicated uh, suspension system. Let's not draw it like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's hanging from some very complicated suspension system. <laughs> Um, and you can you can make your suspension system here here arbitrary good, right? That means uh, if if you, you you wobble up here, then essentially nothing moves down here if you make it super super good. But there's something you cannot avoid, right? And that is you have the ground. Yeah, you cannot get rid of the ground. It's somewhere. It can be far away, but it's somewhere. Um, and in the ground, you have uh, seismic waves, which means there's density perturbations which move, right? So now it's more dense here. Now it's more dense here. Later it's more dense here. So there's just a gravitational force pulling in that direction. And however perfect your suspension is, you cannot get rid of that. I mean, this is gravity, right? I mean, you're, you're measuring gravity. You can't get rid of gravity. Um, and this essentially forbids all measurements below roughly 1 hertz on Earth. Like, and unless, I mean, there's, there's ideas, right? And there's ideas for future detectors that you would like, you know, put a 1,000 sensors and, and try and measure this thing. Um, as as a density perturbation, and then compute what is the effect on this object, and then subtract uh, that from the actual movement. Um, but you can imagine that that's a bit of a so a nightmare. So they are not they were definitely not doing that yet, right? So at the moment it's just a super good suspension which gets rid of a lot of stuff, but it doesn't get rid of everything. So below one hertz you can't go. Um, and of course, before you, you claim detection, you need to be really super sure that you're actually seeing a gravitational wave. Uh, so it helps a lot of two detectors, right? Because we know uh, the gravitational waves. We saw yesterday they travel at the speed of light. So uh, for the two LIGO detectors, which are two different corners of the US, it means an actual gravitational wave, depending on where it's coming from, it has to hit both detectors uh, within 10 milliseconds. Yeah, so anything which gives something in one detector but does not give anything else in the other detector in plus minus 10 milliseconds uh, is, is something but not a gravitational wave. So that helps a lot. But you can still have events which show up in both detectors, either just because of a statistical fluke or because there is actually a correlation. So for example, if you have a lightning strike over North America, it affects the electricity grid uh, on both sides. If it's a big enough lightning strike and if it's central enough. Yeah, so then you would have a fluctuation in both detectors, uh, which is correlated, but it's still not a gravitational wave, right? So the, the output of this detector is very simple. It's just displacement as a function of time, right? It's a single number as a function of time, yeah? A piece of cake to what we're used to from the LHC. Um, but they have like another 50 sensors around, uh, which are trying to monitor everything that could be faking a gravitational wave, yeah? Like the, the power in the electric grid, the trains passing by and, and, and whatnot. Temperature. Um, yeah, so it's challenging. OK. And we'll talk about, yeah, tomorrow, um, we'll talk a bit more about the, the actual first detection. Ah, right. So that was, so t you need two detectors to be able to do, to be able to really claim anything. Um, you need three detectors to do localization. Yeah, because with two detectors, the only information you have is the relative arrival time. Right? So you know, for example, if, if it arrived exactly at the same time in both detectors, it needs to be like on, a, on an arc in the sky, uh, which is like just in between the two detectors. And correspondingly, if it arrives 10 milliseconds earlier in one and in the other, you know it's coming from that direction. But everything else you don't know. So you'll always get kind of a circle on the sky. So with three detectors, you can break that degeneracy, uh, and you can do relocalization in, in three dimensions. Um, and also you can start measuring polarization. So you can st start distinguishing the H plus from the H cross polarization. So with Virgo online, we now in principle have three detectors. Um, and then the, the plan is to really have a detector network because the more detectors, the more you gain on localization um, and, and, on, uh, and also, of course, on, on overall sensitivity. OK. Any questions for LIGO that I can answer? Okay. Then the next um, 
one I want to mention is Lisa. So Lisa is a, a future space-based interferometer. So it's essentially like LIGO, more or less like LIGO, just in space. Um, a launch date, yeah, um, let's, let's say 2030. Um, it could even potentially be slightly earlier. Um, could also be slightly later, but yeah, th things are moving fast and, and are, are, are even ahead of schedule at the moment. Um, it's a, a mission funded by the European Space Agency, mainly, uh, and uh, the mission slot is there, the, the money is there. Um, NASA has now rejoined um, after, after, after LIGO saw something. Um, okay, and what's the idea? So the idea is you have, you have the sun, right? you have the Earth, um, that's us. And then you have Lisa, 5 million kilometers arms, flying on a heliocentric orbit. Oops, it should end up at the same one. Well, you know what I mean, yeah. Uh, for reference, the moon is maybe here, yeah? So this is, this is a crazy, crazy big distance, okay? So the way it, and these, so with, I mean, what do we shoot up is three satellites, right? And then the satellites, these lines indicate that the satellites talk to each other uh, through lasers. Yeah. So essentially, what it, this is essentially, if you want this as three independent or three interferometers, right? You can imagine this is kind of one corner, this is one corner, and this is one corner. Now they have 60 degrees and not 90 degrees, um, and uh, they are of course not fully independent uh, because they do share common arms. Yeah, so out of these three interferometers, one can build linear combinations, so that in the end one is two interferometers, um, which are to a high degree independent. And so you can essentially do a, a, a decomposition so that this essentially looks like one like this and one which is at a 45 uh, degrees angle. And, this, and it, these are essentially the two interferometers that you then effectively work with. Um, and the third channel here, um, is, is what is called a null channel, so that's kind of used for, for calibration. And the way these satellites work is you have two test masses. So what you need in a satellite? You need, you need test masses, um, which in LIGO are hanging from these suspensions. Uh, in LISA, they're just floating in space. Yeah, so, um, and then you have, a, of course, a, a laser system so that you can shoot a laser to your neighboring satellite. And also you need a detection system so that you can receive the, the laser when it comes back. And you need to, of course, be able to orientate your laser so that you actually hit the satellite. So are these three satellites, are there really three such points that you don't need to adjust all the time? Because if you adjust, then you have to push the test bands. Right. So these are three heliocentric orbits. So, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I think I'm going to fail drawing it. But the way you have to imagine is that this triangle, as it flies behind the Earth, it rotates once uh, in a year. Yeah, so all three are flying on heliocentric orbits, on different heliocentric orbits. Yeah, so in principle, uh, in principle, that is, stable. it's not the Lagrange point or something like that. Um, so in principle, that that is that, that that is a stable orbit. You do still have to correct. Uh, so, so, so they are bound like the moon. Still. No, they bound like the Earth. Uh, yeah, heliocentric. Yeah. Like the moon yeah. yeah. They, so they do have to um, they do have to maneuver them, but the main reason for maneuvering them is that they have to align the antenna with the Earth so that we can actually receive the data because they are rotating. So you mentioned that this test mass are actually free falling, right? So how large is the correction? Because you just hit them with a laser, I mean, just disturb them a bit. Is the correction huge? Yeah, it, it limits. That's that's what limits the laser power. So you you send a, a laser over five million kilometers, right? And then you have to make sure that the power is not too big uh, so that you induce thermal, thermal noise on, on your test mass. Um, so they did it with, um, okay, so there's two, there's, there's several challenges. So what they did with LISA Pathfinder, uh, which was a pure technology testing mission, is they put, combined essentially two of these satellites into one, okay? So they took two test masses in a single satellite with a teeny little laser system in between, and they shot it up to the Lagrange point. Um, and then y they tested how how well is is the separation of these is this separation of these two test masses stable, 
right? Because if one of, and also they tested how do you release your test masses, right? Because I mean, for launch, you can't have them free falling in your satellite, okay? For launch, you really need to tie them down. But then you, you get up to space, and then you need to, you know, um, release it. And if you've ever built, I don't know, like a house of cards or something, uh, releasing is, is not so easy, right? You usually give some momentum. But if you give some momentum, I mean, you have no way of catching it, right? Because it would just go, it would just go somewhere. Uh, and I mean, your satellite just will, will try to follow, but it will end up who knows where, right? So, uh, so, what they, um, so they tested the release of the test masses. And then they tested how well are these two test masses um, in, in rest relative one to the other. Um, that worked down to 10 to the minus 15 g. Yeah, so that was the lowest acceleration measured by, by humankind. Um, and then they tested, how, was this stable? Yeah, so because then you have to, at some point, you do have to like navigate the satellite a little bit and you need to make sure, you, you need to, because you, you have in the end, you have your free falling test masses, right? Here. And then, well, in the full system will only be one test mass, and then you have your satellite around, right? Which which the satellite carries the laser, so the satellite will have to uh, move also to make sure that the laser is adjusted to hit the other satellite. So can the satellite move uh, without disturbing the test mass inside, right? So the sat satellite can just fly around the test mass, at the same time kind of talk to the other satellites, at the same time talk to Earth, uh, and all without disturbing this guy. Um, yeah, so it, it, the, the Pathfinder mission worked extremely well. So they had uh, the measurement, the measurement of the noise, was um, yeah, like two orders of magnitude below uh, what was required in order to build, to go ahead with Lisa. So that was, that was super spectacular. Um, but what has not been tested is shooting a laser over five million kilometers and, and receiving it at the other, other end, right? Okay, and then the last type of experiments are pulsar timing arrays. So here the idea is, so okay, so this is a completely different frequency, right? So LIGO was 100 hertz. Um, this is roughly 10 to the minus three hertz or so. Okay, simply because longer, longer arm length. Um, and now pulsar timing arrays, the idea is, again, even longer arm, arm length. So you have the earth here, uh, you have a pulsar here, and that pulsar is sending a regular pulse signal, electromagnetic signal to Earth, right? So, something like. Uh, we detect the signal. And now, if uh, a gravitational wave passes in between us uh, and the pulsar, yeah, that it will lead to a delay of the arrival time of the pulses, right? So, if you measure these pulses, in principle, a gra passing gravitational wave, uh, you will detect by the arrival time. So, that's, that's the theory, right? Now, in, in practice, uh, you need to, again, make sure that that's not, it could also be we do something else, right? I mean, you could just have, I don't know, like a comet flying by here and distorting the gravitational potential would lead to the same effect. So the w this is why they're called pulsar timing arrays. Yeah, so you have many of them, many, 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 like here's another one. So essentially, if you have a signal which could be a gravitational wave here, uh, you can check if it looks the same way here, right? And a comet, like if you have down these two signals, and it's not just two, it's many, then the effect of a comet and the effect of a, of a gravitational wave will be very different. And then there's another real world complication, and the real world complication is that these pulses, um, they are very, very regular on average. Yeah, if you, <laughs> if you look at two such pulses, they look completely different, yeah? Like com really completely different. Um, so the only reason that we can, and, and we're looking for a tiny effect, right? So the only reason um, that we can really learn something from this is because we have 40 years of recordings of these pulses and like a very good understanding on like what, what are the, like how are they allowed to change and it's just some complicated pulsar physics and how are they not allowed to change because it would really be a change in the, in the arrival time. And with this then you can measure um, about 10 to the minus. 10 hertz, okay? So these are super, super long wavelength gravitational waves. And this is, so the, yeah, there's the, the International Pulsar Timing Array, which is a, yeah, kind of now a conglomeration of, of 
lots of earlier arrays. There was a PPTA, the European Pulse Array, Nanograph, and they're also operating individually and also SKA. Um, but yeah, they're trying to combine forces um, to, to get the best best data possible. Basically, do right now because there's no complicated experiment necessary. Yeah, it's, it's running. It's, it's running since 40 years. Oh, okay. So it's running since 40 years, <laughs> um, with with like you know, the sensitivity slowly improving uh, over time. How is the sensitivity improving just by having seeing more pulsars? Uh, it's so it's it's seeing more okay it's, it's having okay having more pulses in your network right um, having better more sensitive detectors which well, which is equivalent it means you can see see further out right uh, and it's really it's accumulating data um, because you really need a lot of statistics in order to understand like is, is a change of the pulse due to something on the propagation or is a change of the pulse just because the thing emitting the pulse has some physics and stuff is going on. So we already have 40, okay, for some pulsars, like for the close by pulsars, we have 40 years of data, right? For the further away pulsars, which we don't know so long, we don't have 40 years of data, right? Um, yeah, but I mean, there's, 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 I mean, I mean, I've seen projections, uh, like for SKA in particular, and I mean, I think there's, there's easily, easily another ma order of magnitude or two that, that we can go down with technology, which in principle we know we know how to handle. Uh, do you have any sources in mind that can give you uh, frequencies of optimized three and optimized ten? Um, yes. So here, the so the astro main astrophysical sources here uh, would be supermassive black holes. Yeah, because the heavier the de the heavier they are. Um, the smaller the frequent, the, the faster, the, oh yeah, the heavier they are, the smaller the frequency is at the end before they merge. Okay, so this would be, uh, Lisa, so Lisa would actually see the objects we saw with LIGO. Lisa would see them uh, months or years earlier. Like Lisa would see them while it's still like a very wide binary. LIGO sees the same object much, much later. So if you had, if you had, this is a cool fact, if you had Lisa and LIGO, op or LIGO-like detector operating at the same time, um, Lisa would pick up a source. I would measure it, you know, for a couple of thousand oscillations, no problem, or even even much more. And then uh, you could compute the waveform, and you could predict. You could t call LIGO and say, "Listen, in three years, two months, five days, twenty seconds from now, um, you are going to see this signal, and it's precise enough that you could even match the phase. So you could predict the phase at which LIGO would see the would see the signal." And then you could check if that if that matches, right? And then you could know in the in the four months, in the say the four years where your signal was out of band, uh, did anything happen to it or not, right? Um, so you would see the same sources, but you would see them much earlier, um, and you would see much much heavier sources. Um, and then of course there's cosmological sources, right? I mean that's what we talk about on Friday. So for example, um, if the if the electric phase transition is a first order phase transition. So not as in the standard model, but as in some extensions of the standard model, um, that would give you a signal which is in the right frequency uh, for Lisa. And then here the very small frequencies. Um, so what can get there, for example, like on okay for astrophysics, I'm I'm not an expert. I would imagine that again the tail of these heavy black holes would reach into here. Um, but also like on the cosmological side, uh, there's the background from inflation. Um, the amplitude is very small, but it's this frequency, and also potentially topological defects like cosmic strings. Uh, they would also show up, and actually, there's very strong bounds on the strongest bounds that we have on cosmic strings. So that's like one-dimensional topological objects formed in the early universe are from pulsar timing arrays, from the gravitational wave signal of those. If there are, if there are more than one <laughs> yes, uh, good question. So the um, so okay. So essentially, okay, this touches two things. So okay, one one is just individual sources, right? So with LIGO, we're now seeing like one event every every couple of weeks or something, right? Uh, 
with Lisa, we'll be seeing one event every every second or something. You know, like it's it's a crazy rate, right? So you'll need a completely different data analysis technique to detect them, right? But yes, the plan is that we can, like transient sources, the plan is that we can actually we detect a big mass, but we can filter them out individually because they have such a big signal to noise ratio, and then we can subtract them, and then we can look at the data which has been cleaned, uh, and then we can look for subdominant things uh, in that data. Um, a related question is, is about if you don't have transient sources but you have a more constant source like a, like a, like a stochastic background, right? Then the problem is like for example with LIGO, um, you have, so for every event that you see with LIGO, I mean there will be a hundred more which you just don't see, you know, which are like just outside the volume that you can probe, but you will see some remnant of that, right? So it will kind of be like noise in your detector. Um, and the first goal is to essentially just like measure this noise and confirm that it's there. Uh, but then the second, the next step in the next generation of detectors would be to, to understand that and to, to subtract it, uh, so that we can then go to the whatever is next. But yeah, that's that's ongoing. But um, yeah, at the, the moment we're just measuring individual events. But like we now need we're already now because I mean, once Lisa's up there, it's up there, right? So we need to now think exactly about what type of of data analysis we, we want to do in order to extract all these sources. And the way they're doing this is that they have these mock data challenges. So they generate a bunch of data where they, you know, they put in, sometimes they tell you, sometimes they don't tell you what they put in. Yeah, so they, they put in some amount of black hole mergers, some amount of uh, stochastic sources, some of whatever. And then, uh, and then they send it to people who are participating in this data challenge and they have to try if they can uh, dig out what was inside, and then you, in the end, they compare what they claim was inside with what you actually put inside, um, and then that tells you like how how well your your analysis chains are working. Yeah, maybe I'm wrong, but I mean, think for LIGO you have to match uh, the signal to templates, right? Yeah. So you have to be sure what you want to measure. But if Lisa, I mean, I think we have some ideas how the cells are look, but I think is it really possible to construct templates? Can just match the signal to them so it depends. Also, so also LIGO does different things, right? I mean, LIGO does this template search. So the template means they they essentially run a numerical GR simulation, which uh, for say merging black holes, which says exactly what does the weight form look over time, and then they match that against the data and see if there's a hit, right? So they do that, and that's their main search. But they also do generic searches, right? So they also just do searches like whatever, you know, when is my signal over 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 this amplitude and and things like that. Um, so with Lisa, it depends. So there's because you you want to, the thing is with the waveforms is what if there's something unexpected, right? Yeah. I mean, what if GR is wrong and we just put GR in our simulation, we would never find anything else, right? So you want to on the one hand you want to have optimized sources for these these waveforms are perfect. On the other hand, you also want to be open for new physics ideas, which you maybe did not expect. So you also want to run generic searches, and these will be the same. So for the for the black hole black hole the, the massive black hole mergers. It's the same story. Yeah, you can comp also do these these waveform analysis. Um, but then there's also other things like stochastic backgrounds. Um, we don't know, right? We don't. So one thing that is currently ongoing is, for example, say you don't know what your stochastic background looks like. Yeah, you say you don't. If you don't, what if you don't know its shape? Yeah, what if you say maybe you say it's a power law, but you don't know the amplitude and you don't know uh, the tilt. Yeah, and then what is the optimal way of filtering that out of the data? Luckily for the stochastic background, we're not in a hurry. So with transient sources, you're in a hurry, right? Because you, the signal comes, the signal goes, and it's gone forever. Um, so then you really need to kind of, I mean, of course you record the data, but you kind of need to, you don't get a second chance at realigning your instrument or something, right? Um, with the stochastic backgrounds, they're always there. So then one can use a bit different techniques because one can also use like the position of the detector at different times as, as whatever, as Lisa rotates around the sun and techniques like that. So until now, there is only LIGO what measures the waves, right? So you cannot do this positioning, so you cannot find actually find out. Where yeah, you can because there's two LIGO detectors and Virgo. Ah. Virgo, Virgo in Italy it was also so that that was the so the very first event was only seen by the two LIGO detectors, but now one of the the, the last two events uh, were seen also by by Virgo. Yeah. 
But I, and I guess the gravitational waves come from the walls colliding, but I don't, I don't see a quadruple moment of masses. Like, I don't see how you get gravitational waves. Right, so you need to, exactly, so you need to, if, so if it were just a single bubble, right, then everything would be spherical and there's, and there's no, um, there's no gravitation wave. So essentially the, the, the spectrum in the end it essentially scales, um, there's two important parameters which determine essentially the amplitude. Um, so one is essentially the total amount of energy which is uh, available in the phase transition. Uh, and the other is essentially determining how fast the phase transition goes or how violent it is. Right? So if you imagine, so if, if you just had two bubbles and nothing happens, but if you imagine you know, you have, you have many, many big, bigger and smaller bubbles and then, then you can get arbitrary complicated mass configurations. And in particular, like as soon as, so imagine you have a big bubble and a small bubble. So if you just had one big bubble and it just expands, you would get nothing, right? But imagine you have a big bubble and a small bubble and they merge and now they become a bubble of, of this shape. Right now, you can start having quadrupole moments. Even though it's not a mass, it's, a, it's potential energy. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be. I mean, I mean, it, it, there's the it's the the, ener the energy which is living on the on the on the wall of the bubble essentially. Everything. Um, so okay. So okay. So for example, okay, I'll talk about this a bit on, on Friday, right? But for example, uh, one thing which we can, in principle, measure, right? Okay, in practice, it's a different story. But in principle, we could measure uh, the gravitational wave background from inflation, um, and that would tell you. And you can measure that at at, at all frequencies, right? So that al would allow you to probe not only, so at the moment when we talk about inflation, um, we only know what happens 60 E folds before the end of inflation. Yeah, because the CMB is associated with a particular length scale, and it can only probe one particular length scale uh, at the time when these quantum fluctuations were created. But gravitational waves, we can measure them at whatever frequency we can, can, can come up with a detector, right? So you could m probe the entire history of inflation, not only just one part of the potential. And then you can also probe the entire uh, expansion history of the universe after that. Yeah, so you could probe, for example, uh, what is the reheating temperature? What was the equation of state during reheating? Uh, what it, at any point in time did any other extra degrees of freedom enter or exit the thermal bath? Like anything that affects the expansion history of the universe uh, is imprinted in the gravitational wave signal. So if you like, imagine, imagine you had a super sensitive detector on many, many frequencies, and imagine you could get rid of all astrophysics, um, <laughs> then, I mean, you could really, like, essentially map out uh, the entire thermal history of a universe, and up until an arbitrary high scale, right, really up until the reheating temperature. There's no limit. You can go, because gravitational waves, they travel, you, it doesn't matter how dense, how hot your plasma is, right? It can be 10 to the 14 GeV, and the gravitational wave will just travel right through it. So in principle, you can, there's a huge amount of things to learn. And then the question is, which signals are actually strong enough that we can pick them up in the near future? Yeah? And that, that depends a lot on how kind nature is to us. Yeah? It has recently not been so kind. Um, <laughs> so like in, the, in, the standard, um, in the standard cosmological pictures, there's no guaranteed source. Yeah, so we could fly, we could have LIGO, we could even have the advanced version of LIGO, we could fly LISA, and we could only be measuring astrophysics. But even that, we would be measuring astrophysics out to very far distances. Yeah, so that, that already, I mean, for, for sure, one thing we for sure we'll be testing, we'll be testing general rel relativity in regimes where we've never tested it before.